All right, we are back for now, episode double nickel, five five of div digital divination. We're really rolling along here pretty quick. <laughs> we are. We are. Yeah. I got I got excited, John, when we got to episode 49. I'm like, oh, that's more episodes than I am years old. So at yeah, some point here, yeah. you'll be able to say the same, right? Hmm? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not yet. Not yet. So soon, soon. Yeah, you know, I, it's gotten to the point we've had so many episodes and, and I was thinking uh, just today, uh, we're, we're looking at what we're going to talk about. We've covered an awful lot of ground on a, a lot of different topics. So coming up with, you know, what is the thing that we want to talk about for any given week is getting to be more and more challenging. Well, unless we get to some milestone like 100 and then for 101, we just talk about whatever we did for 100 episodes prior, right? Right. Okay. We do. Okay. Yeah, that's a, a, a sort of a, a look back and we just do look backs all the time. We'll do a compilation of the previous 10 episodes, every 10 episodes. <laughs> clip shows. We're going to do our own clip show. Yes. Here's what you missed on digital <laughs> divination. <laughs> oh, but I feel oh, like uh, the No Direction Network does that really well for us, right? They give us yeah, really yeah. good summary of, here's what, here's what uh, John and Ron talked about. And I'm, <laughs> I'm like, wow, the fact that anybody could distill our, uh, our yeah, ramblings yeah. into something coherent is, is quite a testament. Well, you know, that, that's Ryan, and, and it's funny because he will bring up things that we talked about that aren't in, like, the description that I, I put on there because he listens to all of our episodes. He listens to all of our episodes. Oh, that's and nice. Then, <laughs> yeah, and now I'm getting kind of worried. <laughs> so it's like, oh, No, it's, a, it's, it's good to have at least yeah. one mandatory fan. That's uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just think about it that way. Well, you know, speaking of of, of fans, I, I got contacted uh, this week by uh, Wade from Tampa, who was uh, saying how much he appreciates our discussion of high level play. He doesn't have the opportunity to do it himself, and so he was like, "Wow, this is really cool," and he likes likes to hear that. So I thought, "Well, we should well, talk fun. more about that." Yeah, that's fun. Let's do. What yeah. campaigns do we have that go up real high? How about Dead Sons? Did we talk about the hardcover compilation of that? Uh I don't think we have. I, I think I, you may have mentioned in passing that, oh, yeah, you know, we're doing this thing for Abomination Vaults and we're doing it for Dead Sons. And I think we dropped it at that point. I see. Well, it's, uh, yeah. it's, not, it's not a secret. I mean, it's on Paizo's right. website uh, right. coming out right. in, I want to say, September. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, the, well, what, so a lot of the work that I'm doing to compile abomination vaults here that i have done to compile abomination vaults here uh, mm -hmm. i talked quite a lot with jason Keeley, who's responsible for the compilation of the dead sons mm -hmm. and how we're doing it differently how he's got frankly a harder job because the adventure path he's compiling is yeah, yeah, a little bit yeah. older that gives people more time to have played it and therefore have some you know concerns about some narrative sticking points or whatever and the fact that it's twice as long right it's a six volume adventure right. path right right well, you know, um, what I kind of wonder then, given that what you're saying, are is he going to fix any of the issues that we came across in there? Well, I mean, that's that's a great question. And that's one yeah. of the things that we talked about what you can do. And one of the yeah. things that we both realized is that you sort of pick your battles, right? Right. If, if you've got an NPC who's... I don't know whose whose modifier is so clearly wrong that it's got to be fixed. Right. Will you go in and fix it? If you could smooth over a bit of a transition from one scene to another, that GM say, "Hey, this is a little rocky, but we still got through it." Do you do you pick your time there? You've got to, at some point you got to get the thing to the printer. So right, 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 right. But there are those sorts of adjustments, though. Yeah, I think he's got. I think he's doing some of them. There's certain. It's certainly right. not a situation where he's taking. All six volumes. We're not taking all six volumes, lying them on a table, slapping a hardcover on it, calling it good. I mean, that's right. yeah. Right. The fact that you're going in at all requires a little bit of of finesse, a little bit of nuance. Um, right. I don't. I don't know. He's not doing the kind of restructure that I did with Abomination Vaults, where I kind of pulled the three adventures apart to be ten different chapters, each one of each level of the dungeon. He's keeping it right. six major chapters, one for right. each adventure. Because, you know, I haven't played through that. Those those six present such different types of adventure that it's right mm -hmm. to think of them as as six separate vignettes almost, right? right. Here is the, the jungle exploration on Castrovo, and here is the uh, the the Eox mega, Eoxian megaship 
right, uh, right, right. story. You know, when I was uh, thinking about the, the compilation and, and I just pulled up the, the, the website, it is coming out in September in a hardcover and a special edition hardcover. And I'm, I'm thinking I might actually buy this special edition hardcover just to have it. It looks pretty cool. Yeah, I might as well. One of the things that we, uh, one of the benefits of working here at Paizo is you get copies of everything that we do, but they don't give you, if something is in regular and special edition, we get the employees get the regular one. We don't generally get the oh. special edition one. Um, but right. I do know some of my, uh, uh, some of my peers, if there's something they really love, they'll, they'll personally go buy the special edition because it looks great right. on the shelf and they're excited to have mm -hmm. it and, and so on, so mm -hmm. on. So but I was thinking about about the book, uh, the whole the whole adventure path, and what I liked and kind of what I didn't like, and what I remembered because I that's where we started, in like is that 2017 that when we started that is that right? Right at the very end of 2017, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's when we started it, and then after we played through it, I actually ran it for for another group, so you know, I, I had a chance to kind of view it again. Uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. funny you know, you'd mentioned a couple of different parts of it, and those are the parts I remember the most. But what I really, really liked about that adventure path in particular, though, even though we were going to talk high level here, is the first book. I, I think the first book is a fantastic introduction to Starfinder. I really, really enjoyed it. And it is packed with so much stuff. I think compared to like any other AP I played in, it seemed to have the, the greatest diversity of, of environments and encounters and people that you can do in, in just different things. I really, really like the first book a lot. Yeah, it's it's urban, it's asteroid dungeon, it's starship, there's a lot of stuff. There is, for as much as I feel like I got the whole Dead Suns experience, um, you know, playing with you guys when I first moved here, uh, I I still missed out on the first maybe third of that first book because oh, you guys yeah. had already been right, playing right, right. for a few sessions. So I'm aware that it starts out with an incident at Absalom Station being called <laughs> Incident at Absalom Station. Yeah. Yeah, but I, yeah. I, I did not get to play what the incident is. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a couple of cool encounters. And, and the thing is for us, when we were brand new, and maybe this is all colored by the fact that we were brand new to Starfinder, right? This is our, our very first exposure to it. But there was just kind of a lot of social encounters, and we didn't know what the abilities of the creatures we were going against would be like. We didn't really know how hard like a DC would be to make and, and things like that. And so we were like super cautious going into everything. And then I think you came along when we were on, on the asteroid. No, when we were on the ship, right? On the Acreon? Right, that's right. Yeah, and then we just got our... our Butts handed to us on that. And oh, man, this this low level Starfighter stuff. This is deadly. This is so hard. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, the uh, and it'd be interesting for me to hear what people think about the when they start playing the collected edition, the hardcover, because right. there are a number of players I I feel like who have joined Starfinder since Dead Suns. I mean, it was first, and it was a really big launch. We were excited that it had so many people. The game had so many people even at launch, but there's been even more who have joined since. And some of those uh, Dead Suns volumes have been hard to find, right? right? If you wanted to have the the physical one, you've got uh, a lot of situation where the playing group might be, oh, let's do what's sort of shiniest and newest rather than than the old Dead Suns one. Well, this at, as of September, Dead Suns is a shiny and new one. So there's going to be people who are experienced with Starfinder playing Starfinder's first adventure path for the first time. And it'll be really interesting to me to hear what, what their experience is like. Are they the same? Are they like, this is, this is real tough or with, you know, that I, I will right. see. Well, especially if they're more experienced players, right? You know, if, if going in as an experienced player, even if you don't know what you might encounter, you, you kind of know how to, how things work a little bit better. And, and so maybe that helps out quite a bit. Oh, I feel like that's right. That's one of the things that, that we were talking about at high level play even is you, you've you got tools to be able to address the situations that come up. Oh, our enemy's invisible. What do we do about that? Oh, it's a swarm. What right. do we do about right. that? Right, right. And in, in, in that in that particular adventure, one of the things I say that I'll say that I, I think we ran into is the incorporeal creatures that... I was mm -hmm. shocked that we would run into them so early on, but there is a way to deal with them. I mean, that you can deal with them even at that low level. But to me, that was so scary. And then, and this one, I don't want to make any spoilers of, 
The final boss in that book is super, super, super scary. Super scary. I I think that's well placed and I think that's yeah, great. Right. Yeah. Uh but I, I know a lot of the feedback at the time was, oh yeah, uh we had a we had a party wife. We had to do all kinds of great creative stuff to get through that guy. Uh so that that in retrospect, that's kind of cool to have such a kind of scary boss at the end. Well, and that was, and I'll, I'll I'll step a little bit more into spoiler territory to make a point here that, that because the final boss is a spellcaster, a high level spellcaster, yeah. And the thing that I've really learned from my from my wife over the years is when we were doing uh, Pathfinder Society early on, and some of us got to be particularly high level, and we were looking around for somebody to run some of the high level content for us, and we wanted to play it to have our characters in it. Um, because you couldn't double up in the early days. If you played it, you if you ran it, you couldn't play it. Right. And so, but my wife cared a lot less. She's like, sure, I'll run the high-level stuff for you guys. And she was kind of, I mean, she was really good at it and kind of lethal sometimes. <laughs> and I remember talking to her one time about, you know, keeping, juggling all of the different abilities that high-level yeah. opponents right. have, especially high-level spellcasters. And the advice that she gave, she gave me, she's like, well, I, I kind of cheat, right? I don't know every single thing that's every single spell that's on a lengthy spell list. You know, when we right. get into a fight, I just look up from the highest level spells to lowest, right? They're going right. to they're gonna start by casting whatever the toughest thing is. What's the toughest thing I can do? It's disintegrate? Well, let me look that up and do that, right? right? It right. doesn't, I'm not even going to look at the, uh, you know, corrosive storm or some of the other things that are maybe a little lower on the spell list because... Mm -hmm. That's that's the tough thing I can do right now. And then when she sees something like uh, that, that's utility, right? If somebody's got Mystic Cure on their list, okay, well I can't do that against the bad guys, so I, you know, or kid against the hero. So let right, me skip right. down. What is, what's the next most awful thing they could do? Right, and right. what it ends up with is not spellcasters that are played necessarily super optimally, but ones that are consistent with the. Uh, with the uh, sort of the the tactics as written, and right. deploy their most lethal abilities right off the right. bat, which right. which makes them feel scary. So, right that that I thought was good. I've actually used that guidance since when I end up having to run something cold or I jump in. I'm yeah. like, all right, well, what does this thing do? I'm not going to look at all of its abilities. Let me look at the toughest ones. What can it only do once a day, or right. uh, you right. know, three right. times a day? Let me look at those and only those because those that's all I'm really going to have time to get off usually. Right. Yeah, you know, actually, you know, getting into talking about uh, GMing and preparing for high-level play, that's that's one of the things I was going to mention to you. It's funny that you just brought it up. If you have high-level creatures that pretty much just hit hard and bash and slash and you know, or shoot at you or whatever, to me, that's really easy to figure out because you have the DCs, you have the dice, you just roll them and, and you can do that. That's really straightforward. It's the spellcasters or the spell-like abilities mm -hmm. that kind of give me the difficulty. Um, because oftentimes the the stat block just says it has it, but doesn't tell you it doesn't tell you what it is. If they have a special ability, then they list out everything about it. So that's a little bit easier, right? Um, so for me, um, I, I kind of do something similar in that I like to use the hard ones first, the more challenging ones first, because I know in most cases the, the battle is going to go less than five rounds, probably three rounds, and then it's right. done, right? You know. It's, Every once in a while, it might go a little longer. So I want to get off the, the more challenging stuff early on. And I want to get it off before the heroes close. And then I have all these attacks of opportunity in Starfinder. Uh, one of the things I do, uh, if I'm running it online, well, up until recently, I did this all the time. I'll print out. I'll, I'll go into the archives of, of Nethys and I'll actually print out all the abilities and, and have them on a sheet so I know exactly what they are. And if something presents itself, then I, I might change the order a little bit. But now with the the Starfinder spell cards, actually, I just pull those out, and there it's a massive brick. So oh, that's said, handy, and you've got yeah, you know, these spells. Yeah. Well, you can even order them from things they're most likely to do down to right. the other stuff, right. and that right. makes it really easy to reference right. in combat. So I like I like having that. I think that that helps an awful lot. Um, when you're going in, the, the most difficult thing is how do they how do you get them to maneuver properly so that they can get off the cool spells and the cool abilities that they have. Because more often than not, you have somebody in, in the player party that just closes right in our, on their face. High level, they have step up and strike. They have no chance. Unless they get an initiative that allows them to go first, oftentimes a lot of the spell casting 
just goes away. And so here you have a caster who's basically either got to flee or bash on the person. Well, and this is this is why from an encounter design perspective, it is more challenging and in many ways more satisfying to instead of having a single solo boss in a right. room with a single solo boss that's at the highest possible level that solo boss could be, mm -hmm. is to have a solo boss that is on its own just a little bit weaker, but fill in the rest of the encounter budget with either environmental effects or really low level minions or even uh, traps, right, that it can spring on players who try to close in. That tends to make for not only a more satisfying encounter because there's a lot going on, right, that makes the characters feel like, that makes the players feel like their characters have a lot to do right. uh, rather than just wail on one, one target. Uh, but it also increases the survivability. Sometimes making a, a final foe just a little bit weaker because you can supplement it with other stuff makes them a lot more survivable. Yeah, mm -hmm. to counter exactly what you were just saying. You don't, you don't want to have a, a big empty room where they just charge up into melee and then a spellcaster can't do anything because they're all because they're locked down. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's important if you're doing the encounter design to have some flexibility like that. And if, you, if the encounter's already been designed for you, it's important to look to see what features of the area or other creatures and things like that are given to you as tools to use. Uh, right. Virtually all spellcasters I mean, by the fact that they have really high level spells are either really smart or really wise or both. And so it's not out of character for, for the, you to think on their behalf, Oof, man, if I've got a whole bunch of murder machines coming in, how am I going to slow them down? How am I going to try to stop right. them? Right. Yeah. And actually in, in a couple of the high level bosses, and I, now I don't want to say which, where these came from, uh, they've had some interesting tactics like that. One of them is greater invisibility. Uh, mm -hmm. And early on when we were playing, we didn't realize we needed to worry about that. And I think now we do. The other one is Force Wall. And I don't know if you remember when we encountered the, the, the boss that had Force Wall. And it's like, that was a real pain in the butt to get around. And I think that guy might even have Force Wall at will. So it really hampered our ability to, to close in and, and do stuff. Yeah, to, to lock people around. Any, any kind of type of creature that can throw up walls that really limit uh, character mobility can really sort of section off the most difficult and troublesome combatants. And suddenly if you're right. a character who's, you know, oh, I'm kind of the backup melee fighter, if need be, it's easy to find yourself in a position where you're suddenly the primary melee fighter mm -hmm. in a situation where the enemy can can lock people down with walls or pits or what have you. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you have a, have a caster that does that, now in terms of the design part, I'm thinking back at a couple of the final bosses, it always seems like if there's a caster type, then there's a couple beefy bodyguards, right? That kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. They know their weak points. They're not going to sit there and, and be fully exposed if, if they can help it. And especially having a, a, a beefy bodyguard that's immune to a lot of certain things. So like uh, the uh, cybernetic golems or have you ever seen a neutronium uh, golem? You ever encountered one of those? No, I put one into something, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't oh. look too closely at uh, at uh, running it at the time. Oh, oh man, they so neutron a uh, neutronium golem. It's they are like immune to light, so they're like invisible in normal light, and they're immune to lasers. <laughs> so, oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah so you think and it's not a super high level? It's like a ten uh, ten cr kind of critter. It's not super high, right? But if you have a party that's using a lot of heavy laser weapons and at that level maybe doesn't have a lot of invisibility, you have this creature that in effect has like greater invisibility that's just pounding on you. It has all the golem properties as well. And you're firing lasers at it and they aren't working. Like, <laughs> and nothing ah. happening. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's actually, um, I think it's a 7 to 10 Starfinder uh, scenario that has one of those. It's just kind of hiding in the shadows. And I've run it like three or four times. And sometimes the parties can't even can't even see them. Don't can't figure out they're there. They get in close and the thing just starts wailing on them and they have no <laughs> idea where it's coming from. They have no idea, you know. So, so then it becomes really tricky with the perceptions and trying to figure out where it's at and try to come up with creative ways to to deal with it. And again, it's the point, you know, set level seven to ten, you're still not in the easy to get seam visibility all the time type of type of thing that usually comes up closer to 10 and above. And, right. you know, so it can be, it can be challenging for. Them. 
or if you've got it, it's on just one of the characters and that one right. character oh, yeah. spending their trying to spend a lot of their time as a spotter because they're the only right. one who can can do it. See invisibility, see invisibility being self. Some of the tech that does that being a thing that lets you see was right. it there's a goggles or a visor or some kind of armor upgrade that lets you, but it doesn't let other people see right. it. So um, you're right. You're exactly. You're right in the level range where one, maybe two people in the party have the tactical advantage of being able to identify the person the opponent that's invisible it's funny that you bring up the neutronian golem about that because that's i think that's where a lot of the trickiness lies especially in these high level high level games because if it's an encounter with a custom built spellcaster and maybe some custom built either minions or or environmental effects or something like that then you know the adventure designer put in some really sort of deep thought about how that's going to play out Right. Frankly, as an adventure designer, we don't do that all the time when we throw in monsters from an alien archive, right? So it could be, all right, well, let's just, I mean, this happened to to, uh, to us just recently. Let's let's throw in a couple of uh, high CR creatures. Okay, Burbaths, those are, those are high CR. They're maybe yeah. appropriate here. Yeah. Let's throw them in. And they have some exceptionally powerful spells they can throw out, but they're not in the encounter with the thinking of the spells they could do as how it affects the encounter. They're sort of monsters that were pulled off the shelf and, and thrown in. Right. And right. as an adventure author, I don't know if I'm admitting admitting to laziness or something, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's exactly right. Like, I need two yeah. CR11 creatures. Let me see. What are the CR11 creatures? Oh, this one sounds like it's probably best. They fight two of those. Right. And then I move right. on because I'm writing other stuff in the adventure without realizing that maybe those are the types of creatures that are like the Neutronian Golem that have uh, these mm -hmm. interactions with player abilities or the types of creatures that become suspiciously un uh, unhittable because they've got a combination of incorporate they're incorporeal and they have blink or something on that it's a couple of things that can right. make a right. uh that can really double down on their unhittability and then suddenly the encounter becomes substantially more difficult yeah and and sometimes and, and i'll say there's there's a another scenario i think it's a five to eight society scenario where the the author intentionally put in a super high level creature, and this one is a uh, it was a nanite golem, and it was like a super high CR, so it's a five to eight, and it's like a CR twelve creature. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and it's like, and it's kind of if when you're writing it up, it's it, and I I played it before I ran it, and I actually played it with John Compton, uh, and there's a, a party we're playing at Pisacon is a lot of fun, and we're sitting there trying to attack it and stuff, and we brought Obaziah, uh level eight coming in we, that's our tank right so we have four mm -hmm. players and and obaziah goes in and this thing crits obaziah and has the wounding effect and tears off her arm oh my goodness <laughs> and at, at that point we realized maybe we're not supposed to fight this creature <laughs> and then when i ran it later some of the text in there says it should become obvious in short order that the PC should not try to fight this creature <laughs> and That's instead a... Use the terrain to try to run away from it, and lock doors and stuff. That's like, oh, that's funny. Sometimes it costs you an arm to learn that lesson, yes, but uh... yes, or Obazaya's arm anyway. Yeah, but but the funny thing, so putting in in that case, you know, the players are used to okay, here's something. Oh yeah, it's big and it's bad, and it takes time to form, so it's forming out of nanites. So you have like four rounds to th see this thing form. So you could run away. You could do lots of different stuff. But you don't know. And we're sitting there waiting for it to form so we can beat on it, right? And it's like, okay, we'll all be ready. We have all our gear. We're ready to go. And it forms. And okay, we do an attack. Uh, you miss. What? I, I rolled a, a 28. How did, I don't know. What? And is it a five man? I miss. <laughs> and then it they roll and it, and it just tears off her, her arms. Okay. We're done. We're done. <laughs> that's oh you know? oh that's our yeah. lesson now. Yes, yes. Yeah, I do notice how people sit up and take notice when somebody gets what they believe to be a really high attack roll and then learn that it misses. Yes. It gets everybody around the yes. table going, wait, wait, what? Right. And then immediately right. people start thinking about okay, what are my other options for fighting this? Right. You know, if I have, you know, maybe you know, a, a magic missile that's not going to require an attack roll or right. something to immediately try to debuff that people start thinking about their tactical options when a, even a, a miss on a high attack roll communicates, oh, this is tougher than we might think. Well, in fact, that's something we talked about before in terms of higher level play. One of the things that the players have to do is stack debuffs, right? In order to hit a lot of these creatures. Yep. And, yep. and they have more ability to do that. I think as a GM, 
that's another thing that's really cruel to do to players. I mean, or, you know, play the degree. If it mm-hmm. has debuffs by themselves, they aren't super powerful. But then if you put a couple debuffs on on the players and then you have the minions coming in and attack, all of a sudden that's way more deadly than it was in the beginning. Right. It makes people pay attention to minions when they otherwise might not. And mm-hmm. or if the minions are the ones giving the debuffs, right? If they've got some aura right. that penalizes you, like, oh, we better take these out quick because they otherwise can capitalize on that. That's a, I know yeah. we're a I know we're a Starfinder show, but if I could talk fifth edition for just a second, um, I've had fifth edition on the brain because of the <laughs> Abomination Vaults 5e conversion. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, Wizards of the Coast recently, and this is pertinent, I promise. Uh, Wizards of the Coast recently revised how they present monster stat blocks. And one of the key ways they've done that is by doing exactly the kind of preparation that you do as, you know, getting the spell cards together and thinking about the defenses and how those work and putting them actually in the stat block. So instead of a creature that could cast disintegrate and putting the word disintegrate among the spells listed and kind of hope the GM spots it by reading toughest to weakest spells or, or something like that, or knowing all of the spells well enough, know, oh, well, this person can, you know, disintegrate. Um, instead, they would put it as a disintegrating ray special ability. Make this mm-hmm. attack roll do this much damage. If it drops right. a person to zero hit points, they turn to dust. It's it, substantially the same thing that disintegrate does, but make it an ability that spells it out very clearly. This is what the creature does. And so it's right there on the page for you. I feel mm-hmm. like that's not only a really easy way to keep the focus on what the monsters can do but it also so it's not only easier to to gm that way but it also gives the monster a lot better focus because if you otherwise would have a high level casting monster where you're like well they can disintegrate and they can caustic surge and that you know they can do the uh you know energy overload stuff like that well let's 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 pull all those to a specific theme and now we're because i'm writing out the power instead of calling it those things i can call it you know nanites that do x or nanites that do y and you know it gives it gives a lot more theme to the power like a nanite golem might have Mm -hmm. to have a uh a monster that fits its theme i feel like moving that direction and being more specific about abilities is something that starfinder kind of already does because monsters that have like an energy ray they can shoot, have that as an ability that sort of spells out. It does this much damage and it can go this mm-hmm. far. And I've found that to be, at the first time, a couple times I saw that, it seemed a, a waste of a word count to me. I'm like, why don't you just give it kind of a spell that does the same thing? Right. But right. then the more I've actually played with it and done it, I'm like, I've, I've been really grateful to have that actually spelled out for players. And you can, you can actually see that in a little bit of evolution if you... Uh, if you if you ever had the time and nobody does to go through and see what are the monsters for Starfinder that Ron yeah. Lundin has made, you'll see that I used to never do that. And now right. I do that a lot more often because I've seen how useful it is to give something like an energy ray ability, um, you know, like a jolt vine might have or something like right. that. Right. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that. I was just going to say I've seen that recently. And uh, of course, we've been running Planetfall, which one Ron Lundin wrote, which does have the jolt vines in it. Um, yeah, compared to, to other things, I, I was actually wondering about that, why that change was made, because it does make it much more straightforward than having mm-hmm. to look at, oh, they have jolting surge, and you have to, to know that kind of thing. But it's, again, with the spell cards, it does make it uh, make it a little bit simpler. Um, I, one of the things I was going to, to mention as well, you know, looking at high-level play and the type of creatures that you can can – run into and you kind of touched on earlier um you know talking about auras and that's one of the things that i hate as a player right when Mm -hmm. there's this aura that you like like those creatures that we ran into uh in the last session um they had the uh dazzling whatever aura Mm -hmm. um, that we ran into um and i remember i ran a, a scenario where there was a dragon which has the fearful presence right Yep, and and there was there were also two uh, cybernetic golems, and they were all kind of working in concert. And man, those auras, especially on the dragons, are huge, you know, in terms of having the effects and stuff. Yeah, there there are a lot of what the creature can do, and uh, to be honest, there's something that's easily missed if you're a GM who's sort of looking right. at a creature for the new time for the first time. 
especially if it's a type of aura that is otherwise fully described in the back of the alien archive, something like the frightful right. presence that dragons have and things. It's, it's easy to miss. It can really change the feeling of an encounter. If you've played an encounter and you've got a friend who's played under another GM, like, right. oh man, it was so brutal because of, you know, the aura that did this. And your friend's like, uh, the aura, oh, no, our, our GM must have missed that line. Right. right, right. So that can be a big change. That's one of the things that, I, I feel like you could make kind of a checklist of if you're coming at a monster without a lot of experience, what are the checklist of the things you need to make sure you look for and special defenses like incorporeality, auras, their highest level spells, and uh, then any tricky special attacks. I, I, that's kind of the, the four things that I would look for first to be able to sort of minimally right. run a, a high level creature kind of on the fly. Yeah, and, I, and I, when you mentioned special attacks, uh, tricky things with special attacks, one of the things that I think is important is tricky things that trigger upon a, a successful hit. So if it has the grab ability, if it has the swallowed whole ability, so if you beat the the the, the creature's AC by four or six or eight or whatever it is, then mm -hmm. something else happens, which in the case of swallowed whole is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> to, to well, do yeah. GM, you know, <laughs> so don't want to miss that one, you know. Right, that's a lot of the theme too. Any creature yeah. that can swallow whole yeah. is exactly the kind of creature that if you look at it, you're like, oh, that's going to eat me. That's yeah. that's it's a very good yeah. thematic tie as far as abilities yeah. go. I think there are some that you're a little bit intentionally, um, maybe theme disrupting. Right, you're like, oh, I can this creature yeah. do that? It's maybe something with its backstory or something like that. But there are right, some right, abilities right. like swallow whole where you're like, oh, that exactly fits what the visuals of the creature are. And that helps with the bring kind of bring the encounter to life too. Yeah. I remember uh, in one of the APs we played in the final book, uh, Julia Kosti, our, our best soldier got swallowed whole by a Neo, what do you call that? Neo Tophet, right? Oh yeah. The construct that. Yeah. Ate him and was going to, yeah. Yeah. Burn him I, up I, on the I, inside or something. Yeah, and I thought that that was really cool. It, it was a really great great way for a frontliner who's up there fighting and typically would cause a lot of issues to take him out of the battle, in essence. Mm -hmm. you know? So, as a as a GM, I guess looking at the special things, if you target them at the right players, how it can change the tide as well. You know, normally if I'm a player, one of the things that we do is we go. We attack the mages, the casters right off the bat because we know those are the ones that are going to be kind of squishy, but also if they get off their spells can can do a lot of damage. And so as a GM, one of the things I like to do is if I can take out their frontliners right away, uh, uh, prevent that sort of ganking of the mage right off the bat, I think that helps make the encounter a little bit more challenging and, and last a bit longer. <laughs> yeah, we had, I had a, uh, um, my good friend Greg, we used to play for a long time. He played a uh, a monk, and he made sure that his monk was dressed in robes and a pointy hat. His theme was <laughs> that all the monsters yeah. should think, oh, that's the wizard. Let's hit him with right. all of our spells, and monks having great saving throws and even SR right, high right. levels. He was he was trying to invert that and uh, yeah. uh, in order to draw that sort, of, uh, that sort of effect. And I always thought that was really clever. I have not yet put in yeah. a expressly martial focused foe who's trying to masquerade as the caster but right. that could that's a really neat idea for for uh um inverting some expectations mm -hmm. that the players might have for a group of enemies like oh get that get that one that's in robes and is holding a staff that glows with power all right well yeah. monks also hold staves that glow with power sometimes well and i think as a gm doing that that works pretty well as a player your gm knows what you're trying to do to does then the the GM have the 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 uh, the the monk have to make a deception check or have the uh, the the monsters make a perception check to to build the tell? The you you or, can't or just decide yeah. this is a dumb enough monster that you know sure I'll go for the wizard yeah. right and okay. occasionally to give right. that to yeah. give a little bit of credence to the idea yeah. right yeah, rather yeah. than have nobody do it. But at the same yeah, time, I think Greg fun. would have a lot of fun with nobody to it, like thinking that he's the only one who's fooling himself and he's literally not fooling <laughs> anybody else. You're like, right, wait, right, that, right. that is a super muscly wizard. What, <laughs> what on earth is going on? <laughs> yes. Wow, that guy's been working out. Good, yeah. <laughs> so. All right, I'm trying to think. 
other things, uh, I level play uh, to GM. One of the things that I, I've noticed, and I don't know if it's been in a campaign that we've played, it's uh, when you get to high level play with starship combat, that changes mm -hmm. quite a bit as well because of all the cool things that the players can do. So once you get to sixth level and then I think again at 12th level, um, uh, 12th, you get extra, yep. extra abilities kick in, but also the enemies, enemy starships, the capital ships, right? That they're mm -hmm. going against at those levels. That opens up all these possibilities as well. And there's a, a lot of things that you got to prep. And it, I think it tends to make starship combat at the high level really long. So low level, it's really long. In the in between levels, it goes pretty quick, and then high level, it can go pretty long as well because of all these extra things that you can do. Even if the number of rounds are about the same, it's just the number of things you can do per round. Oh, right, and and the, it's the same with high level characters. The more options that you have, right. and the more thinking you have to do about your options, the longer every decision is going to make, and that makes combat go a little bit longer. But that's not necessarily bad because you're able to it structure the types of encounters where well, you you've got this these contingencies and these backup plans, now you've got to employ them. And that makes you feel like you're very well prepared if you're a player and that right. you're being sort of stretched into what you do. That, that it hasn't been a waste to have just one hammer that you use for every problem. Right, right. Well, you know, one of the things that, that bugs me about high level Starship combat, I'll say, is that like I, I for Starship, uh, the Starship Operations Manual, I made a couple of... Uh, 17, 18, 20 um, tier starships. And they're all massive capital ships. And when you have the players have a ship, you, the players could have a level 17 starship that they've leveled up over time, mm -hmm. but it's not a massive capital ship. And yet you're going to encounter a massive capital ship that just, it's a weird imagery i guess you know here here we are we're a level 17 transport our millennium falcon and we're going to go against a level 17 star destroyer right right how, how can we hope to win that well that's that's part of the 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 genre right yeah. is the you're this the scrappy little ship but yeah. having built a lot of the it's hard to build those ships on a smaller frame you just try right. to pack yeah. in the points you end up skewing the numbers so badly i had right. a uh um a uh uh, something I wrote for Starfinder that never made it in, I don't think, to anywhere. Uh, I was doing a bunch of different powered armors, and one of them right. was a a 20th level powered armor that turned into a starship, right? you Basically, you're in your powered <laughs> armor, it transforms into a starship, and yeah, you're yeah. flying around, pew, pew, pew. And because it was a single seater, right, just you, it would be a yeah. tiny starship. There was also a tier 20, or maybe even it was only tier 18, something like that, starship. Wow. I, I could not fit enough stuff in there to build a tiny starship on that chassis so i can see why higher tier starships kind of have to be bigger just to to be able to even spend the points that you've got otherwise you end up kind of becoming incredibly overbalanced in you know right. having an ac right. and a tl that are just just way higher than than there ought to be um which may be satisfying for a player to think that you're so unhittable, but it, it doesn't make starship combats any fun. Uh, yeah. So there's, there's balance to be kept in mind there too. But uh, one of the things I really do like about having much bigger ships that you go up against in star in high level starship combat is that there's a, a natural segue after you win, which is let's board them. And then they're the ability for encounters aboard the, the ship. Right. If you've got smaller sort of ships dogfighting against each other well you blow one up and you're like okay we've won now where we're, where else are we going but mm -hmm. there's an extra kind of step narratively that you can put in like, okay we've crippled the ship now let's board it in order to acquire the thing that they were trying to steal or you know whatever and i, I really like that as a sort of an encounter design one of the things i think is really satisfying about hitting level 12 in starship combat is not only is there more cool stuff for you to do in the fight, but that's kind of the level at which you're going up against, as you say, the bigger ships that right. have some uh, um, some narrative that you can put in having been defeated as well. So I don't know. I really, mm -hmm. I really like that. I think that that's a, it's a, it's a good design space and it's a good place to tell kind of interesting stories too. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, one of the things I players always want to do, and I wish we had a, a better rule system for this. And this is actually something I've been thinking about for another project. 
they want to board and they want to they want to take over it right it's like uh, this is our salvage now we've just defeated this massive uh capital ship and it's ours let's go fly <laughs> right. around or sell it or do something with it and it's like oh no no it's got a self destruct so you don't get all that cool stuff and all those credits and all the gear and all the stuff on it uh, one of the things i would i would like to have is a, a kind of a salvage system in where you can if you come across something large like that yeah you know, maybe it's so beat up that you can't use it but you can do some salvage activities and get certain things so maybe salvage some fortification things out oh of that's it. a that's a really good that's a really interesting idea offensive things well where i was thinking of this actually i really want to build a, a post uh, apocalypse type of setting for starfinder and so i've been thinking about one of the things i want to build for is a salvage system so that when you find something you know there are like four different types of things you can work on to salvage they do different skill sets and different levels of what you have and so you can either salvage something or make something new and and re trying to figure out how to balance that out and and a lot of that comes from the pcs always wanting to salvage something from the starship and you can thematically say oh yeah you're able to get this or you get your things for build points as you level up but they really want to get something cool and use it and when we were kids growing up playing gamma world that's something mm -hmm. we loved doing all the time is we would salvage all kinds of cool stuff oh yeah, yeah. and we would have it but then the encounters became oh well, you just come across another party that salvaged a huge tank like you did. Now you're into tank wars instead of just, <laughs> you know, a person to person war. And and that's kind of how we, we would grow and do things. So to find a system that you could, could balance that out, I think would be really cool as well. Oh, I think that's true. I think there's a lot of potential in there. And I feel like that's something that'd be really rewarding for the players as well, especially if the different, if they had like, as you say, like four different types of things you could salvage from. But what, whether or not you could be successful in those depended on how the fight went, right? Right. Like, oh, don't, I get a critical hit. Don't <laughs> hit, the, hit their thrusters. We yeah, want to yeah. salvage the thrusters, yes. right? Right, right, right. Oh, that's great. I like that part. I like that. Well, hey, you know, we're recording this a couple of days early uh, compared to what we used to. And I want to mm -hmm. thank you for, for your flexibility on that, Ron. Even though you're the cause of it, are you going somewhere today? I am the cause of it. Yes, we are going to Hawaii, my whole family. We're going for uh, not quite a week. Uh, it's a long delayed trip. We actually planned this in hmm, spring of 2020. And <laughs> guess what? <laughs> Certain yeah. events caused a, uh, a delay, but we were able to keep the, the reservation. We just kept delaying it and the airline tickets kept yeah. delaying it. And we get to the point where people are now sort of opening back up enough to be able to say either use it or lose it. We're like, Oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to go to, uh, go to Maui for a few days. It's, it'll be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, we're going to miss you all since I am missing three games this week, I think because <laughs> of that. Um, but you know, you'll come back and we'll, we'll recover. It's it actually gives me a chance to catch up on some other work. <laughs> So, oh. <laughs> well, I have some writing I'm supposed to be doing, some milestone due coming up. I don't know what it is. Of, so, of some have, stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. then I've done you a favor by giving <laughs> you some writing time. All right. Well, that was good. We'll miss you. I hope you, ha you guys have an, have an awesome time, though. Oh, thanks. But I'm not the only one that's traveling. You just came back, right? Well, if you call driving up to Vancouver and then fighting all the people leaving early to cross the border and taking three hours. To get through the border real travel it's like oh man i was on the road eight hours yesterday and it's like um to pick up my kid and bring her home for easter easter weekend because mm -hmm. she doesn't have a car now i think we're going to send her back with one of our cars so she'll have it up there now okay. uh, she, she might need it for a bit because she's actually coming back again next month before she takes a trip down to brazil she's going to go do some research there for a month oh wow yeah. So right now she's been, she's been, she speaks uh, Spanish, but she's uh, brushing up and, and seeing how Spanish and Portuguese compare and learning how to, how to speak Portuguese. So it's kind of a fun. Oh yeah. Ironically, I've got a, uh, a nephew who just learned, um, he's a, uh, uh, member of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints just got his mission call to go to, uh, Brazil as well. He also oh, wow. speaks Spanish, <laughs> but not Portuguese <laughs> and now has to learn it in order yeah. to go to Brazil. So. Yeah. yeah. On the drive down, she's practicing with Duolingo and she's telling me 
how, oh yeah, here's here's how the words are the same. Here's how they're spelled the same, but they're pronounced differently. And here's how they have completely different words for the same thing. <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of fun. And she's Duolingo is like a kind of gamification of learning. So she's competing against everybody else. And in the silver tier, she's number one right now. So um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> well, good. That bodes well for her ability to get around when she's down there. Yeah, I think so. Well, the the researchers they all they all speak English there. But mm-hmm. when she's when she's in San Paulo and she's gonna you know look around a little bit there, I think it's gonna be really helpful to have have some knowledge of the language and reading it just to be able to get around and and do things. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that sounds like it'll be a lot of fun. So well, we're gonna let you finish your packing and get going. <laughs> I will. <laughs> all right. I'm John. And I'm Ron, and this is Digital Divination.